I was once watching a documentary, which may still be out there somewhere, um, about and called Love in the Ancient World, where um, ancient Greek and Roman attitudes towards love, sex, romance, all this sort of thing, uh, were examined and shown to be rather different from ours. Um, it's interesting that the show actually started with the implication that we evolved as a species uh, to be a loving species, i.e. in a conjugal sort of nuclear family sort of sense, in order to allow us to evolve or to survive or to flourish. That's another case of what I see as this rampant business of putting some sort of telos behind evolution. We are, evolution is trying to evolve. is <laughs> rubbish, of course, but um, I, uh, I think that that's a common mistake. But in this case, it was implied that um, because the human female and the human newborn are so helpless for quite a while after, at least in terms of bare survival in a savage environment, um, that it is necessary for the female and the baby to have something that the male will continue to come back to after the baby is born. In other words, um, uh, there's got to be a reason for the man to stick around, otherwise the female and the child are too helpless to look after themselves. And of course that thing that the male will stick around for is either sex or love. Um, you know, it, apparently we're unique in that we're one of the few species that uh, have sex for reasons other than procreation. I will leave that for other people to argue not interested in that, uh, but it's just, as I say, a, an interesting illustration of how people, in my opinion, switch the cart around, uh, switch the position of the cart and the horse when it comes to evolution. We don't ev evolve to do anything. We're not evolving towards anything, and evolution doesn't take place to help us do anything, even survive. It's just a process that we read back to, we read back upon what happened before um, to describe what happened. And describing what happened in the past does not imply that there was any meaning in it, or telos, or anything like that. Be that as it may, um, that's not really the point. The, the interesting thing about the series was it delved into ideas like Platonic love, agape, and all those um, ancient um, ideas on love that were worked out in you know dialogues and in philosophical treatises and stuff like that. Um, concerning what love really is. Um, one could say that it's just a byproduct of the urge to reproduce. Uh, that's okay. That's not quite the same thing as, however, saying that we evolved the, the desire or the need or the capacity to love uh, based on an evolutionary requirement, because again, that's putting a meaning in evolution, which somebody's going to have to demonstrate is actually there. Um, which I don't see is there. Uh, so, what is love, though? Um, it's not necessarily purely pleasure. Not at all, as a matter of fact. Uh, for example, look at the love of a parent for his child, her child, whatever. It's not a great deal of physical gratification there. A um, little bit. It's kind of a nice feeling when baby's sleeping on your chest or something like that. But, you know, when you're changing filthy diapers or um, feeding him and he's splattering his food all over your face or something like that or uh, he's screaming his head off while you're <laughs> attempting to sleep um, not a great amount of physical pleasure there um, that's just the most obvious example I guess of uh, the kind of love that really isn't all that physical and again if people are going to say well of course we need to love our children otherwise the children won't survive uh, 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 you're putting a telos behind evolution again behind natural selection be careful with that um, you're gonna have to prove that natural selection has some sort of intent <laughs> which as far as I can see it does not <laughs> it's not going anywhere <laughs> um, so there is that feeling, love, and there are a gazillion different types of love. Now again, you look around you and you see what love really is in our society, in our modern society, and you sort of go, huh, that's, that's love, eh? Yeah, love. Um, if I want that kind of love, I just go onto a porn site. There, that's love. 
Well, yes and no, but occasionally something comes along which sort of transcends the usual, um, or seems to transcend the usual definition of love. It's not just, you know, a bunch of rights that we go through as, you know, people passing through this life. You know, your love is supposed to be for, A, for your parents, then for your extended family, then for your spouse and the children that come along and all this kind of thing. It's all these neat little progressions through life. That's also not what I'm referring to, but that's probably what most people go through when they experience, or that's their experience of love in life. Um, you know, Plato especially um, was pretty good at uh, talking about love where you deliberately cultivate this. It's not just something that you do. In fact, in ancient Greece and Rome, they didn't expect to even like their spouses until after they, uh, after the marriage had been, you know, going on for a few years. Uh, in arranged marriage societies, the assumption is it's always best to make sure that bride and groom like each other, but they, we don't expect them to fall in love right away. That will come with time. So you didn't even marry for love. Um, you married for strictly practical reasons. There's almost an element of eugenics about it in arranged marriage societies. There certainly was in ancient Greece. You would marry a very healthy-looking woman. She didn't have to look very good. You, what you wanted is you wanted very healthy offspring, especially in places like Sparta, where you know uh, strong kids were important, boys and girls. Um, so yeah, you weren't looking for pleasure in in marriage even. Um, the um, ancient Greeks often made a bigger deal, in a certain sense, about homosexual love than they did about heterosexual love, but not for the way that they're usually parodied. Um, it wasn't as though the Greeks were a bisexual society in any way that we would understand, or that they, they were obsessed with homosexuality. They certainly weren't. Um, it's just that they had the same assumption, I believe, that is inherent in our society, that a man and a woman, the, ne the normal sort of... Um, evolutionary or biological drive is for a male to lust after a female and for a female to want to be lusted after. Um, that's the pure biological um, you know, mechanics of it. But in things like agape or platonic love um, or the, the homosexual variants, it was assumed that that would have less of an overtly physical, lustful attitude. And again, that is um, dealt with in that opening scene where Aristotle, in the movie Alexander the Great, is explaining to the young uh, Ephibes, the young um, students, the difference between lustful love and pure love. And he's saying that, yeah, if, even if two men uh, lay down together, but it's with the idea of improving each other, with the idea of going somewhere with this, with the idea of... Um, being pure and non-lustful and restrained in one's love um, and a love that is uh, attached to higher things as opposed to just the base passions is much more to be admired. In other words, take the physical out if possible. Um, a lot of these quote-unquote homosexual relationships that took place in the ancient world were what we would call extremely intense friendships and may have, may have had no homoerotic uh, um, physicality, at least, about them at all. Um, read the sources and you'll see. Um, it was considered just as stupid for um, a quote-unquote queer uh, to be lusting after males, uh, as and just as physical as it was for a man to be lusting after every female going. Um, that was considered equally base, but... The only thing about homosexuality was there was a, a chance, at least, because males and males are not automatically guaranteed to be physically attached to each other, that there would be something higher there, something beyond the pure biological impulse, which also could take place between males and females. Pericles and his mistress, Aspasia, uh, were a notorious or notable ex um, example of that. It was considered to be a very high relationship that these two had. She was just a, she was a prostitute, but a, more more of a geisha, and he they were attracted to each other because of their minds. They had a a more proper kind of love, although it had to prove itself to Athenian society simply because uh, the you know who she was and who he was. 
but it, they came to the, the ancient Athenians came to understand that they had a higher kind of non-physical kind of love. Now, what's all this about? Well, just to sort of, in a sense, put a little wedge there between lust and love. Uh, I think that we we all understand the difference between the two, um, but I think that it's important to understand the first, you know, establish the idea that. There's no impetus behind evolution here. It's not pushing us to anything. So it's not as though we are biologically determined to love. I don't believe that for a second. Um, because we're not biologically determined to do anything. <laughs> Even in a hard deterministic sense, biology still isn't going anywhere. <laughs> um, there's no intent behind any of it. Okay, so we've established that. Now we can say, what is love? Well, I don't believe, again, that it's something that we're pushed to do. There's something else there, and it's not strictly physical. And we will forego physical comforts for love, for agape, or platonic love, where there is no physical gratification at all. Um, we all know that we live in a world of flesh and uh, imperfection, but we can imagine a world in which things are much higher. Um, medieval courtly love springs to mind where you know you spend your entire adult life hopelessly in love with a woman that you can never have but that too is the idea that's the whole point you can never consummate this which makes it better uh, higher um, a lot of people will say again well that's not what most people see as love I'm not talking about most people here I think that's obvious. Um, I keep using the term the herd, and I it, it, that's a sort of a philosophical construct that, in my opinion, solves a lot of problems and accounts for the fact that some people can step up out of everything and look back on it and, in, you know, sort of place value on everything, on the bigger picture, um, just to actually sort of ask yourself the question, is life worth living, if you ask me, puts you above what I call the herd. And I don't mean the herd uh, pejoratively at all. It's just a description. Um, I keep harping on this idea that we, in the modern world, and especially in the postmodern world, it's fashionable to hate the herd, or to at least condemn it, or to laugh at it, or to sneer at it, simply for being what it is. Those people in the line at Walmart are the herd, um, who may be getting utility out of prepared foods, frozen foods, that have almost no nutritional value. Um, and, uh, you know, all the junk that you can buy at Walmart, they may be getting utility out of it. That is, in my opinion, the herd. But they are what they are. I, I don't condemn them for it. In fact, I kind of try not to do that. And I try to remind myself that, okay, it's kind of arrogant. And arrogance is not a good thing, at least not always a good thing, I guess. Uh, it's kind of arrogant to sort of condemn these people for their puny little needs and wants, um, for their slavish, i.e., um, under uh, the ancient Greek formula, their slavish desires for sense gratification. But it's in their nature to do that. If it wasn't in their nature to do it, they wouldn't be doing it. But some of us can step above that and sort of say, okay, I've had all the sense gratification that I can think of. I want something else out of a relationship love. Um, I don't think we can blame evolution or raw sensuality for that one. Um, and I say blame because a lot of people consider love to be a vice. Whatever it is, it's certainly not a grossly physical thing, or at least it isn't in all cases. I think that if you just sort of let love take over uh, and come to you and sort of become a part and parcel of your life without you actually being involved in the process of love taking over your life. It can be, in many ways, a purely physical thing. But if you are, as it were, opting to cultivate love in your life, you are the one who is in control of it. It's not pulling you by the gonads. It's not pulling you by the libido. You are saying, I want to be in control of this love thing. 
it's not going to control me. Um, that, that, I think, is what Plato was talking about when he talked about agape and platonic love and things like that. And that's what is implied again in the opening uh, scene from Alexander the Great. If men lay down not in lust together, now how the heck you can do that? Well, it may take a lifetime. You have to educate people. You have to get people like Aristotle to teach you how to do this. Uh, not an easy thing, but it can be done. Um, the uh, aristocracy of ancient Greece um, were nothing if not high aimers. <laughs> um, a lot of people will say that that's impossible. Well, I don't know. Simone de Beauvoir and uh, Jean-Paul Sartre seem to have come fairly close to that ideal. And um, you know, there are any number of strong friendships that are also perhaps conjugal relationships that are impressive throughout history and throughout lives that we've lived, throughout people that we've met that seem to go beyond the purely physical. Um, love is bigger than that. 